Cool. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, really like art into science. Um, happy to, to speak here again with my partner in crime, Oscar. Uh, like disclosure, we've never worked blue team a day in our life. Uh, we're we're red teamers, um, but thank you for having us at the conference of defense anyway. Uh, we at least think we have something uh, valuable to contribute. Um, and it all started with uh, a question. How do you know what is exposed to the internet in your cloud environments? Um, I'd love to have a conversation after the talk if anyone has like other ideas on this, but we, when we set out to originally answer this question, there was just nothing to do it, yeah, not, nothing available. Yeah, no, uh, some different tools show you a handful of different exposures, but it didn't seem like there was any comprehensive set of tooling out there that was showing. Yeah, so, so who, here, who here supports cloud environments? Yeah, everybody at this point. Um, and if you're responsible for securing them, um, like our ultimate goal was really at any given moment in time and space, like what assets are exposed to the internet? Um, and we know a, kind of a few ground rules of uh, like to be very successful in keeping that type of inventory up to date. Um, we knew that like you can't let that data get stale. Uh, basically, everything is constantly changing in cloud environments. There's a lot of dynamically generated assets. Uh, so um, one like fundamental objective we really want to be able to pr improve upon for 2020 is like what is the frequency and the accuracy of our asset inventory so that we can make operationalized uh, uh, decisions and, um, with that data. Um, if I could ask everyone to have like one other takeaway uh, as you're thinking about your, your inventory for your cloud accounts, stop thinking in terms of IP addresses completely if that's what you're currently doing. And I know a lot of old security tooling and a lot of old security techniques very much focus on uh, IP addresses. Uh, even when people scope out penetration tests, they're thinking about what are the IPs that I have. That model does not work in cloud accounts, uh, it, and, and we'll get to why. So it, it, as we think about things going forward, um, we're really focused more on the domains and DNS records, because ultimately that's how our customers, our employees, and even our service accounts and, and tools interact with systems. It's not typically based on IP address. Uh, you still do have to account and consider for IP addresses and ports, because uh, you, you can't, I guess, completely forget about it, uh, but primary keys in inventory should probably be shifting to DNS records. Um, so building this baseline of an inventory, uh, what the, like to be as comprehensive as possible, we really started thinking about it as your brand. So what is your organization's parent brand? You may work at a very large multinational organization that may have grown through merger and acquisition, and so you may have multiple brands, or you may have uh, multiple products or services. And then um, we need to evaluate basically what that structure is of the overall parent organization, what business units exist, uh, if there are um, unique domains that are registered for products and services, those should also be considered. Um, and I know a lot of uh, organizations struggle with, okay, we, we thought we had a good handle on inventory, but they just announced next week we're acquiring a company, um, and everybody that does know what's there is, is uh, not joining on with the company, so how do, we, how do we tap in and start to figure out what, that, what they have? Um, primarily focusing on what the registered domains are, and then from there evaluating the subdomains, and then the IP space, and then the active services, will give you a much better uh, comprehensive and, and way to continuously update your inventory uh, in an accurate way uh, so that you can, like I said, operationalize that data. Uh, you want to speak a bit about this? Yeah, so um, IP addresses, again, they're, they're useful. That's the underlying backing portion of what you get when you're resolving domains. Um, as a blue team, you are working at the organization, you have the master records for these things, the uh, dom like zone transfers for domains, the list of subdomains directly from, let's say, Route 53. Uh, that information is something that if you're attacking from an external perspective, you don't have as much insight into. You have to go enumerate that data, brute force that data, or look for different external resources for that. So having an internal view of that is super important. Yeah, so what the methodology that we're, we've um, developed alongside with quite a few of uh, the large organizations we work with is, is taking both the inside looking out lens along with the outside looking in lens. Um, and really the, the benefits of that uh, are that 
like where possible, let's try to stay multiple steps ahead of our of attackers by tapping into our domain registrar, our mark monitor systems, tapping into our info blocks, and uh, that's every change management of DNS goes through, or tapping into Route 53 data. Like let's leverage that for all of our testing and our analysis to know if we have vulnerabilities. Uh, but Conversely to that, um, why you also need to be doing outside looking in, and by that I just mean really open source intelligence techniques, the techniques that real attackers use, um, is because you only know what you know when it comes to those master records. And if you're applying both of these techniques, you're definitely gonna spot shadow IT. Like one of our customers said, we don't use AWS, we're all Azure and Oracle uh, cloud shop. Uh, when we applied this technique, we breached their AWS account that they didn't know was even being used. Um, yeah, and, and a lot of that stuff ends up, you know, it's, it could be third-party services, it could be um, any kind of like SaaS system, and what ends up happening is that even though that's not something that's owned by the company, it still houses like customer data and customer sensitive information. Yeah, so we applied this technique to a Fortune 50 company, and this is what we saw. Uh, what they knew about um, as the intersection with what we were able to find uh, by starting with what are all the brands, what are all the mer mergers and acquisitions, we actually tapped into a Wall Street data feed to build out every merger and acquisition they've had over the last few decades. Um, that then pointed us to the domains of all of those companies and then uh, applying the, this approach really yielded um, about, uh, I guess it's like 300% gain in knowledge of what they actually had on the internet. Um, and, and they have a very like large and well-funded security team. It's just um, they weren't thinking about it in this terms. And they uh, were tapped into uh, just only the master records that they knew. And, and they actually like, admitted, they said, you know, we, we feel like we have a good handle on what we have in our IP space. But when it comes to third-party hosting and third-party infrastructure, including uh, publicly available cloud services, we feel lost. Um, so this was a, a step in the right direction. So how do you identify these cloud accounts? Our recommendation is start with the money. Uh, basically, if a, your CISO can go make uh, a, a kind of handshake agreement with your CFO of like, let us see all the credit card statements uh, of all of the engineering and IT and employees uh, so that like, or, or just notify us whenever you see charges going to a cloud service like AWS, GCP, Azure. Um, we need to make sure that's in our inventory of, of cloud accounts. Uh, and essentially, this is more of a people and um, uh, process of re reviewing your accounting um, to see if you're covering everything. Uh, and even if you only just saw every credit card charge for AWS, at least you could find out whose card that's on and go have a conversation with them about getting um, those assets in your inventory. But one thing to be aware of, um, this is a screenshot from my refinery.io account last month. Um, on the credit card, it doesn't show up as anything related to AWS, but it is only for building serverless functions uh, in AWS. And so I don't think our IT and um, at Bishop Fox has found this shadow account yet. <laughs> uh, but next step would really be to create one account for security. So add one more uh, account, ultimately, that you as the security team can operationalized to monitor all of the other accounts. Um, you can kind of yeah, speak about this. Yeah, so um, the, the way that we've been uh, tackling this problem is we're asking customers to create the auditor role account, the read-only auditor account, um, and then perform a, an assume action or assume role functionality into their accounts so that we can pull out this data that's important in terms of external attack surface and, and perform a testing that way. Yeah, and um, Azure has service principle to do this, GCP supports this as well. Um, ultimately, it's, it's your, gonna be your inside looking out lens for those cloud accounts. Um, at that point, let's assume that you've identified them all from looking at financial records. Let's assume that you have access uh, uh, set up correctly. Now the next step is we wanted to be able to find out which ones have public facing systems in the form of um, basically DNS records, IP addresses, and ports that were open. Um, and for the, fo uh, there's other, um, complexities of this, because there might be things that are internal only between, di between different accounts in your organization. There might be tr uh, different relationships of specific services that are accessible globally from any other AWS account, not even ones in your organization. So the permissions and exposure, like what an exposure means can get really tricky, but for the purposes of this talk, like we're only talking about stuff that's anonymously available on the internet. Um, 
Yeah, and so like, let's, like the data elements that we want. Yeah, so in order to identify a target, something that we can interact with from the internet, we want to follow kind of a handful of things, right? We want a, the scheme host uh, port combination, any relative URIs that are required in order to interact with that functionality, and some insight into whether or not it's publicly accessible from the internet um, anonymously. Yeah, the reason um, that we didn't only want to rely on IPs, because if you go to most IP addresses in, in AWS, uh, nothing, it'll, it'll be an error. Uh, because it, in the infrastructure in these, in these worlds is all about your vhosting, all about your DNS record that, and, and often path in the URI that routes to a vhost. So whenever we're building a modern uh, asset inventory of what's exposed to the internet, we really need to be focused on um, what is like your representational uh, attack surface versus like your actual uh, attack surface, but representational in the sense of how do people and other systems actually interact with these. They don't go to the IPN port. They go through uh, perhaps a randomly generated uh, URI that um, is mapped to a DNS record you have. And the web services that are backing all of this infrastructure rely on that host name or that path in order to correctly route to the correct functionality in the back end. And if you do not have that, you, are, you're, you could still scan, but you're not going to get any useful data out of it. Yeah, so what um, are the available tools and techniques and what services do we need to consider uh, specific to AWS? So if we kind of look at in 2011, there was a handful of services. In 2017, there were hundreds of services. Um, and the rate of adding services just keeps growing exponentially. Um, there's like, I'm sure by next reInvent, it'll be like around 250 different things you need to consider that uh, are services, but not all of those even can generate a public exposure. Um, so how do we figure out which ones can? Uh, well, we thought this would be real simple. We thought we'd like uh, fire up Cloud Mapper and then it would just list those out for us. Uh, I know there's like, I really am a big fan of that project. I know Duo Labs, a lot of folks from Duo here, uh, partnered with a guy named Scott Piper to, to build this. Um, really impressive tool. Definitely check it out if you haven't, especially if you want to kind of map out relationships of your internal network or just use the scripts and the code to collect a lot of metadata about all of your assets. Um, that tool actually points to another tool. Called, uh, he says, you know what? I don't actually do a very comprehensive job of getting the public facing assets. Go check out public IPs. Um, this is like a very do one thing well focused tool. Um, he's like, I just want to list out all the IP addresses in, in a list when I run this simple uh, Ruby gem. Um, and but we uh, evaluated that and, and found it didn't really meet our needs because things aren't really accessible by IP address, as I mentioned. Um, there, there are a handful of services that you can access by like EC2. When you get an EC2 box, that is your IP address, at least for the length of time that you own that EC2 system. Um, and there's a handful of other ones that you'll get like a static IP for, but the majority of these services do not. Yeah, and. AWS's answer to this is use Access Analyzer, which was just announced at, it, like first was discussed in July of last year, but it's um, just released at this past reInvent. Um, we'll, we'll get on to a bit more like why that didn't exactly do what we wanted to do either. And then Cartography is an open source project on the Lyft um, uh, repo. Uh, they, um, this also uh, does a lot of interesting things, but uh, didn't exactly quite meet our needs. Um, some of the limitations with, uh, like I said, Cloud Mapper was it doesn't. Re it, it's really focused on like what are your uh, firewall rules indicating of what TCP ports and UDP ports are in use on assets, uh, but it does ignore like uh, ACL rules and a lot of things that, that should factor into whenever you're figuring out what's exposed to the internet. Um, yeah, any other thoughts on that one? Yeah. So uh, what I really liked about it is that it did have kind of the the scheme host port combination when you output that data. It says like here's the the path that you need to request, here's a specific port and the type of protocol it is. So when you're trying to perform that action, it, it works really well. It just doesn't, uh, as it has, I think, five different uh, supported services out of the 194 on AWS right now. Again, not, not that entire 194 has an exposed service, but um, it's not comprehensive, definitely. Yeah, and, and like um, Oscar mentioned, public IPs is good for the things that you can rely on accessing via an IP address and port, like EC2, doesn't fully cover all the things either, um, but it, it, it's nice, like, a nice script that you might want to build into it, your workflows. That one does not have associated ports, it's just IPs, so you kind of have to scan or, or identify what protocols are associated with those. Yeah, uh, Access Analyzer is basically to tell you, like, this account 
ID can access your S3 bucket. And so this is, again, more like about relationships within your, all of your accounts um, and mapping those out for you. It, again, doesn't meet the need of, like, just give me a list of all of the things that are publicly accessible. Um, if it does do that, I couldn't figure it out or it wasn't intuitive. Um, so maybe if anyone else knows how to do that with it, please let me know. Um, and you also have to create and pay for an analyzer in each region uh, of each account that you have. Uh, so that's another kind of limitation of this. Um, cartography, I think, is probably one of the best options out there. Um, it has, like, this is a screenshot from their GitHub uh, uh, readme uh, page, which, where it does have, like, which EC2 instances are directly exposed to the internet, tag those with an attribute so that I can answer that question. Um, this has, like, more uh, setup overhead for our purposes, like, you manage a database, you manage a graph, uh, like, Neo4j, build a graph of all the things. And it is, I think, very uh, intended to be, like, a blue team tool that lets you and like be able to write these queries and answer all these questions about your environment. We just, again, wanted that. Just give me a list of what's exposed. Yeah, and this one has a lot of intercommunications. Like these systems can talk to these systems internally. Um, and it had a few flags that let you say, hey, is this publicly exposed to the internet? But again, it wasn't very comprehensive. Yeah, really glad and grateful for all the hard work that went into these tools. These were very inspirational to us as we were solving the problem. But it uh, kind of summarized like what they do and don't do there. Um, so, of course, we like set down the path of building yet another tool. Uh, what, yeah, you want to speak about like the APIs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, in order to get, collect this data, if you try to use the AWS CLI tool, for example, every one of the 194 different services have a different JSON format that they return. They have a different naming convention for what is an exposed path. Some of them have port information, some of them don't have port information. So going through each one of those is, is a time consuming process. Uh, we found a, a handful of things online that helped kind of identify what services may have exposed uh, infrastructure and which ones don't. Um, this uh, open API directory had a APIs for all different types of services. We, we tried to scrape that one to identify potential paths that maybe ha would have like the scheme host port combination. And it was definitely useful, but again, not, uh, not consistent and didn't have an easy way to identify that data. Yeah, and so um, this basically Wikipedia of API documentation that's being updated every week uh, uh, for the most part was a good sniff test or clue of how to interact with all these services. And then we cross-referenced that with um, DNSDB data, which is uh, just massive collection of global uh, uh, DNS requests uh, to basically get real-world examples of these um, to help better understand and define and publish uh, the patterns that you should be looking for. Um, so this may help if you're also feeding a lot of CloudTrail information to your Splunk or to your, to your SOC or SIM is able to, to watch your DNS requests. If you're seeing um, things in your environment or, uh, or you're seeing your users interact with these and they can be associated with accounts you're responsible for securing, this may help you uh, like, like track down also in your DNS records uh, like which products, services uh, are relying on these AWS services to, to enable usability. If you try to search through the Amazon documentation, um, some of these URLs will show up. Um, some of them will be sample URLs, so they'll have US East 2 or US East 1 um, in the name. So they'll, the, the, the have, like, naming convention is a little bit different. Some of them will have um, the like representative region uh, replaced in there. Some of them will only be inside of a screenshot, so you can't parse that data set out. So going through and identifying all of these is, again, a non-trivial test through the uh, documentation. Yeah, and um, so these are kind of the, some of the core services that this will cover a lot, and this is kind of, um, some of these were covered by those other tools, but there's more. Um, the, the list goes on and continues to grow. Um, it became really interesting as we saw what the real world requests look like to these. Um, and, and this kind of goes back to what I mentioned of like what you really need to be focused on for your inventory is more like wh how is this being virtually hosted? How, like, what is the user experience to interact with these? And then um, how can I tell if that is a vulnerability or an exposure? Uh, you need a ways to get visibility into it. And so um, we started poking around and just kind of looking uh, only in US East 1. So this is by no mean like a... Con 
by no means a comprehensive analysis, but we found um, right off the bat 59 exposed instances of Elasticsearch. Over uh, 1,700 of those had were like multiple megabytes in size of just data that's out there for anyone to go download and, and look at. Um, but if you but internet scanners won't find this. So if you ha are relying on like um, like a Shodan data or something like that, it'll just scan every IPv4 address. Um, it will get this when it requests the uh, to see if there's exposed um, Elasticsearch, the bottom screenshot there with the error message. Uh, unlike if you go to the proper DNS record, proper virtual host, you'll actually get um, so that in this case it's search NW public randomly generated value and then US East one that would get you uh, to the vulnerability. Um, also then as you start to explore these other services, not all of them are even uh, just simple web applications like the uh, media store is for hosting uh, uh, and streaming uh, video. video. We found um, every single, uh, if, you, if anyone has a Samsung TV, you might know it comes with an app called TV Plus, has hundreds of channels, uh, which are freely available and no ads and everything, um, uh, but you're meant to have a Samsung TV to, in order to be able to watch them, but we found all of them. Uh, and uh, again, uh, IPv4 scanners cannot find this, um, but like if you go to the, that's kind of hard to see, but if you go to the randomly generated um, id.data.mediastore.use-1.amazon.aws.com, you can uh, pull the playlist and, and stream your videos. And again, just because that this is um, exposed doesn't mean that it's vulnerable. There's different ways to configure media store. Um, you can have it require auth or a, like a signing key for that to, to request that media. So these are just kind of wide open implementations. Yeah, Samsung could add to their TV app a way to authenticate to these to prove that it is a Samsung TV, but they didn't. Um, so we're going to be uh, publishing up these patterns and then some code to go pull all this type of data uh, uh, with Smog Cloud, the cloud that hurts your eyes, <laughs> pollutes your neighborhood, <laughs> gives you cancer. I, I, <laughs> um, and I also thought that uh, you all may find this very useful. This is like, it's not intuitive how to query every region and every account, uh, but here's some bash scripts to do it and some code to help you uh, figure out that if you're looking to instrument some of these techniques at your organization. Yeah, so with the AWS API, there's no simple API that you can request to say, what regions uh, do I have active services uh, running in? You have to request every region uh, and cross-product that with every service available. So you end up having to make like 2,500 or so requests to Amazon to figure out what regions am I actually using right now? And what services are my uh, do I have enabled in those regions? And then out of those, pulling out what are the relevant pat, like scheme host port combinations that matter. And that's it. Any questions? Yeah, so the question is, uh, do we have any plans to do a similar thing for um, Azure? And the answer to that is yes. The, like I mentioned, the service principal account would be like the equivalent kind of account that could peek into all of the different Azure accounts. And there are, um, there's APIs and functionality to pull the same type of metadata and information. Um, we just did AWS first. Uh, and we're, uh, we actually have uh, an engineering team that's helping like support this and, and make it very reliable and scalable and everything. Um, and so that's, that is uh, in prototype slash beta, moving into beta with one of our customers right now. Yeah, so the question was, um, have we tapped into the passive DNS data? Is that? Oh, no, no. Certificate transparency. Oh, cer oh certificate transparency. Uh, yes. Um, so kind of on the topic of the outside looking in uh, approach, we're like, I think approaching like over 75 different techniques of open source intelligence, including certificate transparency logs to find um, wildcard DNS records um, for finding uh, other things that would be really difficult to, to know about any other way. And attackers are doing that as well. So like we feel like it's important to emulate that um, to 
uh, monitor uh, essentially for the IT you don't know about yet if you're on the blue team. Like uh, that, that would be another good way to find shadow IT and and merging that and cross referencing that with your internal records is challenging. That was something that we also faced as we started doing this at scale because uh, how do you eliminate wildcards from your data set uh, and not fill your inventory with a bunch of garbage? And, and honestly, like one of the best ways to do that is relying on like, f uh, we have like four different confidence techniques of knowing A, that something like belongs to you and B, knowing that um, it's available right now and you have to con continuously be running that analysis to keep it up to date. Uh, otherwise it gets stale and your inventory isn't as useful. Any other questions? Thanks, everybody.